Do you uh, ever just feel just a little bit uh, afraid of uh, whether it's heading to a mall or downtown Philadelphia uh, that someone may pull out a gun and start shooting? Does that ever enter your mind? Um, maybe not. Maybe you feel secure in that, but I do know, and as I've interacted with different people, there's a level where when we see mass shootings and we see those types of events going on, it just puts a little check in us of fear. Maybe you're, you'd be fearful of traveling overseas and, and being, you know, concerned about a terrorist cell. You know, there are those who serve and travel in countries where terrorists are still a real threat. Terrorism. None of us like it. It's designed to not only bring death and carnage, but most of all, terror, right? Terrorists, are, their intent is to scare, to terrorize. Well, I don't know if you're aware of it. I, I think you are because we began to teach on it a couple weeks ago. Uh, we in this country, in your neighborhood, you're not, f- uh, you're not distance, you're not safe from terrorism. And we all know that the worst kind of terrorists are those you can't see, those you can't follow, those you can't trace, you can't find out. They're they're communicating secretly, and you never know when they're going to hit. Now, you also know that I'm not speaking of a, you know, of a physical terror cell, terrorist cell. I don't think there's one in my neighborhood in Barclay. You never know, but I don't think so. But at the same time, I recognize that as we go through our lives, we do face spiritual terrorists. And so as we look through this passage of Scripture that Paul lays out as the armor of God, in many ways what he's challenging us is to remind us, challenging us to live in light of the fact that we are in the midst of a war. And it's more of a terrorist-style combat than an outright war because we don't know when it's going to hit. But we know it's going to hit. We can have rumors. But what we see and what Paul has given us is the intelligence to say it's going to happen. It's going to happen to every believer in Jesus Christ. So it's time for all believers, but especially for us as we're here today, to begin to understand that what what God has called us to is, is not only to be believers, but to be part of his elite, gospel centered counter-terrorist terrorist group. That's what the church is. So as we look at the passage this morning, we're recognizing here's the battle. The battle is severe. We looked at what we meant in that battle a couple weeks ago. And this morning, we're going to begin to talk about specific parts of that armor that we put on. And interestingly, the first part of the armor uh, is, is not something that we think of as an armor. But let's stand together. We're going to read from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read, we're going to keep reading this passage over and over again. But Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, as we read your word, uh, first of all, Father, it's, it's so easy just to doubt that this is really real. Is it true? Do we really fight this type of cosmic war, these type of, these cosmic terrorists who are out to destroy 
the believer, us as individuals and your church. Do we, do we believe it, Father? And Father, as we confessed earlier, we struggle with really believing that your word is truth. But Father, we come and we come to hear your word, to hear it preached. And so we pray that you'd give us the grace to believe, to hear, push away any doubt, and give us, Father, the strength to be able to apply it to our lives. Not just by our own strength, but the strength you promised to give, in us, to give us through your Spirit. Father, I pray again that as I preach this morning, that, Father, I would not be a distraction. I pray that you would not allow me to say anything that is not true. But, Father, may my words and my heart meditations glorify you. Father, may you receive all the honor and the glory and the power. Amen. You may be seated. What Paul is describing here is the armor of God is the picture of a warrior. Now, it's easy, and, it, and we're going to in many ways come back to uh, the idea of what a, what a soldier looked like when Paul wrote this letter. And it's true that probably when he wrote the letter, he was chained to some level of a Roman soldier. And I, and I do believe that he pulls a lot of this, not only just from a Roman soldier, but, but how, how a soldier would be properly armed in that day. But underneath all that is what, what's so important to realize. It isn't just a Roman soldier that we need to picture here. Because remember, when we look at the Bible, it's all of the Bible. When we come to understand what does a warrior look like, we just don't look at a few passages from Paul. We look at all of Scripture. And ultimately, if there's a picture of the ultimate warrior, it, has, it is no Roman guy, I promise you. It's actually the Lord God Almighty. He himself is the picture, the Lord of hosts that we see throughout Scripture is the one who would fight battles for Israel and fight them in amazing ways. So underneath our understanding of, of what this is, we have to picture the Lord of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, who fights for his people, the warrior fighting to vindicate his people, who watches over them, you know, there's one thing to see a picture and say, be like them, right? You can show me a lot of pictures over here and say, be like this person. Some of you may say, uh, here's not only a picture of a really good preacher, Bob, but, you know, here's a sermon. Be like him. I can't. But some of us as students want to be like an athlete. We want to be like somebody, a musician. We want to be like them. But just being like them and trying to emulate them, that may be a start, but it's never enough. So underlying all that we have to do as we look through this series is understanding that God is our warrior. And not only is the Lord God Almighty have we seen him fight battles in the Old Testament, but we read earlier in our call to worship of the warrior that we have in Jesus Christ who came and he fought the ultimate battle against sin, the flesh, and the devil, so that we could have life. So though Paul logically, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says here's a picture, these are important things to remember, underneath it all we recognize that these aren't just simply things that we stick on. They're not stickers or if you're, if you're old school flanograph pieces that we stick on a person. These are things that God describes through Paul, but also God enables us to wear, to put on. So what he's describing is that well-equipped arm uh, warrior. But it's also to remember, and I'm going to remind you this on a regular basis, that we are to put on or take up the whole armor of God. We're going to look at it piece by piece, but you need to wear it all. And that's why this passage of Scripture needs to come back every once in a while and say, hey, you know, did I forget something? You know, ironically, there are times where you may head out the door, and one of the things that you forget uh, is your belt. Now, most time that may not be a problem for you, but other times it would. Most time if you walk out the door and forget your belt, you'll just look down and go, like, oh, I should have a belt on. And so this morning, one of the things that we're going to look at is the belt of truth. But even as we do so, we look at it in light of what he's already said, the standing posture 
the standing posture. So that's the stance of a soldier is one who's he's not slack. He's ready. It's a picture of a, a, a soldier who's ready to fight the battle. One who is ready to, 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 to get engaged. One who is prepared for battle. So in these verses, John Stark writes, we don't see somebody uh, who is, is a wobbly Christian with, with, who has no firm foothold in Christ or an, and an easy prey for the devil. And Christians who shake like reeds and rushes, who cannot resist the wind when the principalities and the powers begin to blow. Paul wants to see Christians who are strong and stable, that they remain firm even against the devil's wiles. See, so you know well, it's a, it's a stance of preparation. And believe it or not, one of the important steps in that standing and that preparation is the armor, is the armor of the belt. In verse 14a again, having fastened on the belt of truth, or more literally, or girded your loins with truth. Now, as we look at this, this girded your loins with truth is an is a idiom. In other words, it's a description of something else. To gird up your loins is to, is to, to make yourself ready. You're prepared. You're ready to fight the battle. You see, the belt was simply more than something that would hold up your, your, your pants, even though that's very important. But it gathered the tunic. It held everything. It was a place where the sword was held. It, it, it ensured that you could get up and run because, remember, they'd wear loose clothing and, and the belt would hold it all together. And, and as the robes were long, they could tuck the robes back up into it. They're ready for battle. And this is what held it all together. But it, like I said, it carried the sword and it gave a sense of security and well-being. It allowed them to run, to move. As Stott also writes, as he buckled it on, it gave him a sense of hidden strength and confidences. See, when we think about that, belts and braces in our lives do that. So this idea, though, of a belt, and, and, and in some ways, as I was thinking through this, it, it, and the reason many of us skip over it is because we, we, we fail to see the significance of it. Now, there may be some of you that hang all kinds of stuff on your belt, and, and you know, you, you recognize that you desperately need that belt. We've all seen or heard of videos of, of criminals who are running away from police, and they, because their pants, they're wearing the baggy pants down too far, their pants fall down, they trip, and they're caught, right? So we recognize, yeah, there's, there's a place for this, but, but why in this? You know, and, I, and you may even have a hard time evaluating, catching, why, why is this so important to a soldier? But as I was thinking about it, and many of you know that uh, uh, Chris and I have uh, spent a lot of many years on horses. We used to own horses and uh, enjoyed riding. And when we, we lived in the South, we'd go out on trail rides, and, and still we get a chance to ride a horse. Now, there's a couple of things that are important when you ride a horse and when you put a saddle on his back. Most of you can't ride bareback, uh, and so putting a saddle on is, is, is an important process. And I, as you train the battle, you put the saddle on the back, you do all the right process, but there is something, a strap, that goes under the belly of the horse that you pull around and you tighten. You know what that's called? It's called a girth. So when your saddle is ready to go, your saddle is girded up and you're ready to go. So what happens? Well, there's a couple things. When you oftentimes, if a horse is smart and they know what they're doing, they will actually fill their belly with air so you can pull the girth tight. And then after you get on, the, get on him, he all of a sudden lets the air out. Guess what? It's no longer tight. Many of you maybe have experienced that before. Maybe you've gone on a trail ride and, and you go and you go like, I want to gallop. I want to go full speed. And guess what? The girth is not tight. Have you experienced that? So what happens when the girth is not tight? If you're a really good rider, you potentially can still stay on because of your, your knees being able to hoard the horse if you can ride bareback. But for most of us, if the girth isn't, isn't on tight, the saddle begins to slide. And you try to balance it out. But if the horse starts going fast and takes a couple sharp corners, the saddle falls around to the side and you fall off. In the same way, what Paul is describing, this idea of being girded up is this girth that would hold the important elements of the soldier together. It was a necessary part of his battle. It was a necessary part of his stance. And if he didn't have it, he wouldn't be able to stand firm. 
So the girth, the belt of truth. So what about the truth part? Paul, as he brings this up, what's he, what's he addressing? Some would argue that Paul is arguing that Christians need to, underneath it all, if you're going to be a good Christian warrior, you need to be honest. You need to be truthful. Tell the truth in love, as Paul would say. And I don't disagree with that, but a spiritual, you know, someone who is in a spiritual battle, honesty matters. We're not discounting being a truthful person. But there's something even more important that as we go into battle that we need to make sure is tight and secure around us. Something more than just simply speaking the truth, but that is a confidence that we can have as we go through our lives. And that is, is the very truth of the gospel or the word of God. Though honesty is an important mark of believers in Jesus Christ, we're talking about the truth of God. 19th century Charles Hodge wrote regarding this passage, it means truth subjectively considered. That is the knowledge and belief of the truth. This is the first and indispensable qualification of a Christian soldier to enter on this spiritual, in on this spiritual conflict Ignorant or doubting would be to enter a battle blind and lame. Nothing but the truth of God, clearly understood and cordially embraced, will enable them to keep their feet for a moment before the celestial pontitates. Truth alone, as abiding in the mind and in the form of divine knowledge, can give strength or confidence even in ordinary conflicts of the Christian life, much more in any really evil day. Charles Hodge has it right because the truth of what Paul is talking about is the truth that only comes from God. The belt of truth is the word of God. God's word is truth. And what we see realized is we recognize that the Bible is God's word revealed. It's not everything about God, but whenever God speaks, it is truth. Because it is part of who he is. And we recognize that what we see in our scriptures, the Bible, is God's word revealed. It is his, his word to us. What he teaches us. A couple passages of scripture quick, quickly. From, as Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them, again in his prayer, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Now, what sanctify means is to set apart. Set them apart in your truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. Paul in Romans 1.25 is a passage we may be familiar with, that where, again, where Paul's speaking about how humanity and specifically the people of Israel became increasingly sinful and rebellious against God. In verse 25 of chapter 1, he writes this, They, they have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul is talking to Timothy, giving him his advice as a young preacher. And he said this, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So what we recognize as we come to the belt, the girth that's holding us, giving us confidence, it's the word of God itself. But we also recognize that Jesus identified himself as the truth in John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And as we saw earlier in John 14.6, Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Throughout the Bible, we see that the gospel is ultimately the, the truth revealed. The, the good news of Jesus Christ is the truth. But in this passage, what Paul seems to be speaking of is the word of God is truth. We'll come to righteousness and salvation. But at, very, at the very heart of our confidence, at the very core of our ability to, to fight the good fight, to be able to make it in this world, to be able to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish is to recognize that because God is truth and his word is truth, we must gird the truth around us. Now, 
you may say, Bob, that's easy for you to say, but how do you know what is truth? How do you know what is true? And here is part of the struggle that we face in our modern day. And all of you are aware of it. It doesn't take you long to look out in culture and realize that most of our modern culture today says there is no such thing as, a, as, as absolute truth. We can, what truth is to whatever you choose it to be. I can have my truth, you can have your truth. And not only that, I can have my truth, you can have your truth, but you can't force your truth on me because there is no absolute truth. So ultimately, whatever you choose is your truth is an authority in your life. And you can see that. We see countless scores of, of decisions that are made. How do I identify myself? How do I identify my own gender? How do I identify, you know, what I like or what I dislike? It's simply by what my truth is. It's what I feel. It's who I am. That is my truth. Those struggles and those wiles of the devil, I will say, are rooted in basically, I'm going to give you three train, train, <laughs> strains of thought. And first, they have all been around for a while, but they continue to grow and they affect us. First is secularism. And secularism is, is, you know, seeks to interpret life based on the principles derived solely from the material world. In other words, the things that we see, but not anything else. But notice what it says, without recourse to religion. There's no room for religion in secularism. Again, noted humanist and author Jim Herrick wrote, secularism is the largest sin, in, it, in the largest sense means that people do not refer to religion to make decisions, to adapt policies, to run their lives, to order their relationships, or to impel their activities. Do you get it? At the very heart of secularism, there is no room for religion. It's unreliable. It's not true. And it should not be part of any area of our lives. We have lived in a secular society for many, many years now. The second one that we need to be aware of is philosophy is that of humanism. And humanism considers humans as the starting point for any kind of serious moral or philosophical inquiry. As the humanist, a humanist is a, again, by the American Humanist Association, this is their definition, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that desire to the greater good. So we're thinking of all humanity. It sounds really good, doesn't it? But at the very core, there's a rejection of anything supernatural. The third strain that we need to be aware of is, is pluralism. And pluralism basically is whatever, whatever is true to you is true. Pluralism would argue that there's no one faith, there's no one religion. That, you know, each of us need to understand that and, and embrace what, what the other would believe. So ethical pluralism is the idea that there are many theories about what is right and wrong or moral norms, which may be incompatible or un, incommensurable with each other, but is okay for yourself. Basically what it says is there's no wrong faith, there's no wrong believing, there's no wrong faith system. So, now we could go and we could spend a lot of time recognizing that's the world that we live in. That's the lake we swim in. That's what we do as we go through our lives. That is what we face on our social media. That's when we're scrolling down, when we're reading the news, when we're listening to music, when we're reading just about anybody. We recognize these three and more have have driven under our ability to grasp the truth and are basically not only whispering in our ears but screaming in our ears, there is no absolute truth. Now, I want to be careful because we can look around our world, don't we? It doesn't take us very long to look outside and see people making some decisions that are really in many ways absurd. Why would you do that? No, it can't be true. And you, you argue with them. Somebody you have discussions with people that from a, from a Judeo-Christian approach or from a biblical approach have totally messed up their lives, but they feel like they're absolutely right. But, but they're not here. What we are doing is we're equipping ourselves to go into battle. And because, as I said earlier, this is more of a terroristic type of an approach, but that terrorism is through information. 
We also have been aware of that. We have to recognize in our world, and I'm going to tell you this, at no other time in history have you as individuals been able to find so much information. People who, in every form of media possible, communicate their views and advocate that it's true. Many of those are secularists, they're humanistic, and they absolutely seek to destroy Christianity. Others are just simply those who throw God, the word Scripture out there to, spare, uh, to share the same type of lie. We need to have an understanding of what the truth is. So we as a people, we need to figure out how to tighten up our belts as the people of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter writes... Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you in, at the revelation of Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know, again, what I read from this ESV, preparing your minds for action. You know how that, again, and I don't like to do this often, but you know how that is more accurately translated? Is girding up the loins of your mind. Peter has the same thing. We need to gird up. Our, he's taking it for, and being more specific as saying, you know what, to survive in this world, to be the people that we need to be, there, and to be truly sober-minded and to have our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ when Jesus returns, we need to gird up the loins of our minds. It's like Peter saying, put the belt on your brains. Be aware. Peter, it's amazing how closely he ties to what Paul describes as the belt of truth. We need to prepare, and Peter's asking us to prepare for vigorous and, you know, spiritual exertion. Paul says the same thing. It's a war. So what we need to do is to recognize that as we face this war, we're going to begin to put all the pieces together of this battle that we fight. But ultimately, at its core, we, we, we have to have a starting point. You've got to have a starting point. I want to tell you, if, if you begin to believe that there is no absolute truth as a believer in Jesus Christ, you've already lost before you ever started. But for most of us, we're, it's, that's not our point. It's not that we doubt that the Bible is the truth. Most of us recognize, as we would say, that the Bible is, or the, the Scriptures, the Bible is the final authority, as we say, for both faith and practice. It is the truth. Truth means authority. So if something is true, that means, you know, I, I need to obey it. So if we recognize God's Word as truth, that authority becomes part of our lives. It guides us. It's the basis of our very decisions that we make. So we have to ask ourselves, once again, is the Bible, is Scripture our ultimate authority? And I'm going to tell you, that's the most important question you'll ever have to face. And you go like, no, no, Bob, the most important question I have to face is whether I believe in Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you that if, <laughs> if believing in Jesus isn't rooted in the truth of Scripture, then you've missed the point entirely. We have to believe that God's word is true to believe that we need a Savior. See, God's Word, as it's been revealed to us in the Bible, must be that final authority regarding what we believe and how we live our lives. To not do that is going to leave ourselves ill-equipped, wide open for battle. And We must begin to that process. We must come back to recognizing that the truth comes through a knowledge of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth, as we come to, we must recognize that even when we struggle and we doubt, I don't want to leave you just sitting here and saying, okay, Bob, I'm struggling with this. Because here's what's, here's what's actually beautiful about the truth. The Word of God as it's, re as it's revealed. We can't discover it until it's shown to us. You can look for it. 
And there are those who study Scripture. There are scholars who have spent their entire life studying Scriptures, and they know the text of the Bible far better than I do. But the Word of God's never been revealed to them. And the Word of God hasn't been revealed to them because it hasn't been revealed by the Holy Spirit. The truth, the way, and the life is given to us as a gift from the Father, and it is revealed to us as we come to faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the hope that we have. That even as we go through life and we get confused, as we get confused, here's my challenge. And you've heard me say it again. Don't neglect the reading of the Word of God. Don't neglect from hearing the Word of God preached. Don't be satisfied with little 30-minute devotionals every morning. Don't be satisfied with that. Make sure you begin to have time to say, you know, this is really important. This is really important. Don't treat the Word of God like most of you do when you fly and the poor flight attendant's telling you where to get oxygen. Nobody's listening. Don't do that. Recognize that if I'm going to get through this life and if I'm going to understand when that terrorist is going to hit me next, I've got to know. I've got to know what's true. And pray in your own prayer life that God would reveal that to you. That He would make the Word of God even more living and active in your life. That you would have a desire to read it. You'd have a desire to know what's true. And then when you face the decisions in your life and when you're in the battle around you and you feel like you're losing your footing and you feel like you can't stand any longer, you go, oh, I've got the belt of truth. It's girded tightly around me. So whatever I may be feeling, whether it's fear or doubt, or any other spiritual struggle we may have, we can come back and recognize that it's true. I, I, I'm starting to believe lies. Father, take me back to your truth. In the bulletin, there was a quote by James Montgomery Boyce, who was the pastor at Tenth for many years. It's dangerous to rush into battle without having the great doctrines of faith fixed firmly in our understanding. Americans especially hear this, for we have a tendency to think that the act, that activity is the important thing and that convictions or truth do not matter or at least are of, are of secondary importance. Without truth, without the doctrines, without the knowledge of who God is, who we are, what we become in Christ, and what we have been called to do, precisely the things the kinds of things Paul has been teaching in, throughout this letter. Without this, we really do not know what kind of activity in which to engage, and we will be vulnerable to Satan's onslaughts and wiles. Now, I'm going to risk closing with a little bit more of a comical approach, but it's a picture I want you to see. Earlier I mentioned, you know, uh, there's scores of videos. Don't do it right now. I know you can do it on your phones of people who uh, try to run away from the police, their pants fall down, uh, and they're wearing boxers underneath, so it's, it's safe. And as they're running, they trip and fall, and the police are able to catch them. As believers in Jesus Christ, one thing you will see as we go through the armor of God, there's nothing for the back. There's no protection for the back. You've got to face it. We have to face our world. We have to face our culture. We have to face our own struggles. We have, we have to make sure our belt is tied around us because if we begin to be a people who are scripturally illiterate, don't understand the Bible, don't care about the Bible, we will be those who are constantly running away from the enemy. And I promise you, as you run away from the enemy, spiritually, your pants will fall down, you'll fall, and you'll trip. But by God's grace, he will give you the strength to face, to fight, and he will recall to your mind the truth as you study it and you look to it and you read it. That's the promise of Scripture. And remember, the armor that we're given is the Lord's. It's Jesus is fighting with us. We're not alone. And that's the best part of all. Let's pray. Father, as we come this morning, uh, we are in a time where there is so much more fun things to do, to read. Uh, 
Uh, it's way more entertaining and in many ways distracting to scroll through social media than to read your Bible one more time. But Father, we know that we need your word. We know it's the very foundation of how we live. We know that if we build our house upon the sand, it's going to fall. We know that, Father, we need your word. So, Father, as we close this morning, we pray once again desperately that you'll give us a new love for your word. Give us a new understanding of how important it is. Help us make time to read it, not just for knowledge's sake, but to be able to apply it to our lives. Give us time to meditate on it so that as we go through our lives and as we go about the battle that we have to face, the temptations, the discouragement, whatever it would be, that we have the truth of your word girded tightly around us. Would you do that, Lord Jesus? And Father, once again, we pray as we come, we want to give you back a portion you've given to us. We recognize the gifts that we give. We don't give out of guilt or, or, or compulsion. We give them because you love us and you have been so good to us. Take these gifts, use them, we pray, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.